Today we're announcing at the city the plan to implement the recommendations uh, from the most recent Use of Force Commission. We, re we do continue to remain committed to making the changes, which was ultimately at the goal that I came in at the very beginning of my administration, and that is to improve the public trust and confidence in our police department. And obviously we find significant value in the detailed work presented by the commission. But before we start and go into that, I just want to go over a few things, and that is initially the mayor's uh, immediate action plan, which we started right in the first days of the administration. It was confirmed and worked with the council on a supporting and concurrent resolution. But as we go through, and I'll just start there, some of the um, items that were on that immediate action plan. We started it within the first 100 days, but we continued it through the uh, rest of the year. We'll start basically on the oversight side, uh, publishing our IAs, which had been a long-standing request both from our, uh, our Office of the Police Ombudsman, Tim Burns. We are doing that with the current ones, and we're making a lot of progress on the ones uh, until the day that actually the OPO started. And so we're making significant uh, um, progress there. Uh, the body cameras, we have evaluated the use of those. We have looked at all the options there. We have tested those. So we're ready to, uh, when the evaluation is completed, vendors are being identified to support those. Civilian oversight, the citizens have spoken just uh, earlier uh, uh, this week. And uh, really now is the process of how do we implement that. Citizen advisory, uh, the chief as he came on board started to uh, re-energize that and I think much of the community will see that you'll see police officers at the command level um, and all throughout the organization engaging with the public in community meetings, engaging at the city uh, council meetings and at the neighborhood council meetings which really lends itself into the access of the officers, um, community participation in law enforcement Really, as we continue to do that in re-energizing our COPS program, also re-energizing our website and our communication with the public, community accolades, I have to give a lot of credit to our uh, city council where they show this over and over again and even uh, in the weeks to come or in the next week to come as we uh, reward those citizens that are participating with us in the volunteer programs um, and then also our own police officers. But the city council has been doing that, incorporating it into their meetings um, as we get the feedback from the public to really in a public way identifying those officers that are going above and beyond and connecting with the community. Training, the use of force policy, obviously that's what we're going to talk about today. Vulnerable populations, training our police officers and I think uh, the chief, and I know the chief will be talking about how he's doing that, how we are already doing in-service training, but more importantly, what we're doing going into the future. The last two sections, um, improving property crime investigations, a huge issue for our, uh, our public, um, and rightfully so. And the chief is going to talk about his use of ComStat. I've started to attend some of those meetings and really looking at that, and we've had some early successes Obviously, uh, the trend line's going in the right way, but I would not say we have the trend uh, fixed yet. But really, the, the utilization of what Chief Straub brings to the table with his command staff on how we do that. Interacting with the police, again, um, all the information that is, uh, that is reviewed by the Ombudsman's Office and other stakeholders, I think, again, going in the right direction. Uh, the review of the IAs, again, in a lot of ways, the public can look at all those. Those are on many different websites, not only the police website, the ombudsman website, but in many ways, all of the public can look at that, and all the stakeholder groups can look at those IA reports and make their own determinations. The OPO and Mr. Burns has the responsibility to look over them also, but really I think it's exciting to see that anybody, any citizen, true transparency can look at those. And finally, uh, the last two, and that's the um, adopting the COP standards for internal affairs. We'll be making an announcement very shortly about that. And also accreditation. We are in the process of going through WASPIC accreditation this year and ultimately would lead us into the CALEA uh, in, the, in, in the years out. But I think initially we should be looking to our own partners within this state um, that are familiar with this state and to be accredited within the state and then really look at the national standard. Let me talk now, really, and that's, that was, uh, that was the, what was in the resolution from the City Council. That was what was part of my immediate action plan that we really focused on. And some of those is uh, we worked to 
um, look across the country for the best police chief we could, and I believe we selected him, and he is here with us today. But many of those, I said, let's get those started immediately so that that process can be in place as a new police chief comes in. He has continued to execute those, and then today we'll be talking about uh, really um, his strategy and the city's strategy of looking at the Use of Force Commission recommendations. Most importantly, folks, what we have here today is we have a chief that reached out to the U.S. Department of Justice and the COPS program and asked them to come in to help him look at some of these things. They have agreed to do that. They will be coming in later this month to help us in, over the months to come to have representatives from DOJ's office in Spokane as they start their assessments uh, this month and the weeks to come to help us go through many of these recommendations, look at best practices from around uh, the country and how different police forces are addressing these issues, many that have come up from the Use of Force Commission, and assist us through that process. And what is exciting is to see the command staff within the police department invite this scrutiny into their department because they want to make sure, and as my uh, prerogative as we become the city of choice to be the safest city in our community, in our region, this is one of those key issues. I'll talk a little bit about the recommendations. Some will be easy to implement, um, uh, while others will take uh, some time and definitely will take some resources. But it is my job to make sure that we prioritize uh, those and also my job to make sure that our police department has the resources vis-a-vis -vis our citizens uh, to do what we've asked them to do. So we have identified a lot of the expenses and the investments that we're going to be, uh, need to be made. I'll plan on now working with the council to identify those immediate investments, where those dollars will come from. But again, I want to talk about what will those investments be made in, and Chief Straub is here to talk very specifically about why those investments need to be made. But first, it's the tools. What are the tools we provide our officers? Are they the best tools that they can have? Some of them are out here in front of us today, the old ones, the new ones, um, and everything. We also have uh, dashboard cameras and other things that we need to implement immediately. Secondly, it's the training. The reality is that police work is a people business. It is our officers. We need to make sure that they have the latest training, the best training, so that they can couple that with the tools that we provide them so that they can provide the best services to our citizens. And so in that uh, training, we need to make sure that we de-escalate issues. We need to make sure that we have the best internal affairs. We need to make sure that we have the officers that the citizens expect. And the final piece is technology. You know, I jokingly said earlier today, I wonder what, you know, as our officers are working on technology that may be upwards of 20 years old, where was your cell phone 20 years ago? What does your cell phone look like today? What is the information that has provided you on that cell phone? I mean, and the reality over the last 20 years are we've been giving our officers some of that technology that is your 1988 cell phone. Many of you wouldn't have a cell phone in 1988, where probably all of you have it today. And it is that type of technology that we need to bring to our officers. And what, is, what does that mean? It means some of these things the chief will talk about in front of me, but also the virtual training in the use of different type of tools, different weapon systems, different um, pieces of equipment that we've given them, and that's in the Virta um, training facility, the virtual training uh, apparatus that the chief will talk about. But it is also about software products that we need to provide them so that they have the information on hand when they go there. So, uh, as we spend time rev uh, reviewing and revising our policies, becoming more transparent like we are today and in so many ways we've done over the last year, we're going to attack the Use of Force Commission uh, recommendations in a way that is proactive. I agree with all of them. They're up here in front of us and I'll go shortly through the ones that really represent um, the part of the administration uh, that I have the direct responsibility over and then really the overarching aspects of what this means for our community. If we want to be the safest community, we need to make sure that we are doing these items uh, that the Use of Force Commission spent a year, and many of you in this room and many of you listening to this were a part of. And I would say, and I just have to say once again, I want to thank uh, Marty Martin, the commissioner uh, that led that group, and the entire commission on what they have provided the citizens of Spokane. So I do want to talk uh, real quickly about those uh, items uh, that really, in many ways, uh, have already started. 
Uh, and these will be uh, those of civi uh, citizen oversight. I am very um, pleased with the leadership of uh, Mr. Salvatore and others in the, uh, the council, um, and even the public uh, safety chair, uh, Nancy McLaughlin, and their forward thinking um, about having this go to the public. What does the public want for oversight? Overwhelmingly passed, and so now the issue is we need to, in the administration, start implementing that and working with the stakeholders of how we make that happen. The policymakers uh, came up with the policy, the citizens have confirmed it, and now it's the job of the administration to start the implementation process. The other, 23 through 26, uh, you know, and in many ways, uh, we were already going along, and I think the commission talked about that. We identified them early on. They confirmed that these are areas that we need to look at. Everything from uh, the mayor being involved in the police department. Well, folks, I think the police officers and the police department uh, can confirm that. And I've talked a lot about it, and it is, it is my number one responsibility to the citizens. It literally is. It is what I should be doing. Um, the other are um, really the use and looking at our policies and procedures. Um, and really, I think the key issue also and, um, is what we started on day one. And that is as we look at providing uh, legal assistance to our police department, as we look at maintaining the risk of, uh, of a very risky business, um, and at the same time making sure that we provide justice to our citizens. We did that on day one. Uh, I separated uh, the legal responsibility of advising the police from the legal responsibility from defending the police. And not only that, yes, I outsourced the person that tells us what is the risk of each one of these cases. Why? Because we need an on a person that does not work within this building telling us uh, what our, our risk assessment is on these cases. So we have, um, and with the assistance and direction of the city attorney who said, you know, this is work that needs to be done outside the legal department so that we can have an opinion on these cases so that we can make sure that we have uh, the proper uh, legal stance and really the proper direction for our community. So those are some of the things and you can get more detailed on what that, uh, what those areas are that we have worked on. We still have work to go. Um, but, you know, the reality is um, this community, like I have said, we cannot wait around for the infamous report. We need to make uh, progress on the areas that uh, we know we need to do. It is, it is satisfying to me to see that much of the work that the Use of Force Commission suggested and has uh, directed us to, uh, we were already doing. But there is work to continue to be done, and I certainly understand that the final report is coming. There has been some uh, suggestions to, you know, of that report, but the, the recommendations uh, will continue to stand with some fine-tuning underneath. So I didn't want to wait around any longer uh, for us to take action on that. And the key to that was, and I just can't uh, uh, reemphasize enough, is to have a police chief that is not sitting around waiting to find out uh, what other agencies uh, think we should do, but really reaching out to those agencies, whether that be the Department of Justice or others to say, come in, we are committed to not only these recommendations, but best practices from around uh, the country, learning what those are, implementing them in our community, and making sure that we continue to have the safest community, which ultimately will lead us to be the city of choice for the Northwest. With that, with a lot of the specific issues of some of our tools and our techniques and our training, uh, the chief will uh, elaborate on those. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. Let me begin with the uh, discussion of the Department of Justice and how that transpired and what it really means to the city. So, as m many of you know, the mayor um, asked for a pattern of practice investigation um, early on. The Department of Justice is taking a look at these um, issues very differently now. Um, there are really two ways to go. One is a pattern of practice investigation which leads to generally the appointment of a monitor. Um, that monitor is usually um, under the auspices of a federal district court judge. Uh, you see that going on in Seattle now. You see it in New Orleans as two departments that, that jump up to the surface. It is a um, very laborious process. Um, it is one that gives the city um, very little say in what's going to happen um, in terms of the reform or re-engineering process. Um, and at times, and if you look at the, the news lately, you'll see that it can be a very contentious process. Uh, New Orleans and 
the Department of Justice are having a pretty uh, difficult time right now. It's also typically a very expensive process um, because the city has to pay the monitor, has to pay the expense of all of the audits that are done, uh, and then uh, enact the recommendations that are made through the audit. <coughs> DOJ came up with um, another alternative, and that's what we're going to be falling under, and that's what's called a technical assistance letter. And what happens in that um, process is the Community-Oriented Policing Services um, Division of Justice, commonly referred to as COPS, works in conjunction with the Civil Rights Division and with the U.S. Attorney in whichever district. In our case, it's the East District of Washington. They allow the COPS office uh, to come in <clears throat> to work collaboratively with uh, the police department and with city officials to determine what are the critical needs that need to be addressed. They do that through um, a series of um, techniques or methods, if you will. Um, they're certainly conversant with the news. Um, they talk with stakeholders. They read, um, in this case, the Use of Force Commission. They've read uh, the City Council ordinances. They've read the Mayor's Action Plan. Um, through the U.S. Attorney's Office, they clearly have followed uh, the ZEM case very carefully. So working hand in hand with kind of a, a, a triangular effect, the U.S. Attorney, the Civil Rights Division, and COPS, they determine what are the critical needs of the department. In this case, um, they will be focusing on initially two areas. And the first one will be, um, and it really is consistent with, I believe, the Commission's first recommendation was a diagnostic of um, the police department's culture. So uh, the COPS office will come in, they'll, they'll actually be here uh, next week, um, and they will begin the process of diagnosing, uh, studying, researching the department's culture. How will they do that? They will talk to people in the community, they will talk to um, people at the Center for Justice, the Native Project, the NAACP, uh, to name a few. Uh, they will certainly talk to the U.S. Attorney, they'll talk to the FBI, They'll spend time with the mayor and the city administrator, with the law department, with Tim Burns, our ombudsman, with council people. Um, they will talk to, by the end of the project, every single uh, Spokane police officer. They will speak with the command staff. And the idea is to get a 360 uh, perspective on what our culture is all about um, and what needs to be improved and how do we get to uh, improving those aspects of our culture. The second area that they're going to look at is our use of force investigations. They're going to go back and look at four years worth of uh, data. They're going to look at every single use of force investigation that we've conducted over the past four years and read the entire files for the purposes of determining what we did right and what we did wrong and what we need to improve on. We envision this process will take probably somewhere between three to six months uh, at a minimum. Um, if you want some information on how a technical assistance letter and technical assistance project works, um, if you go to the Las Vegas Metropolitan uh, Police website, um, they're just, <clears throat> they're about three quarters of the way through the project. Um, the study's been done, the recommendations have been made, they're now in the implementation, but it will give you an idea of um, how vast these projects are and how encompassing they are um, in terms of bringing the community in as well as the police department and um, appointed and elected officials. We believe though that we can't wait for anybody. We, we, we are committed, and I said this um, since day one and the, the mayor has said it um, since his election, to, to changing the police department and moving it forward. Um, I think and I'm pretty confident in saying this, that the community has seen that change starting already. Um, they have seen greater engagement of our police officers. Um, you've seen much more uh, communication with the public. We meet on a, uh, a monthly basis with all of our news directors uh, from all of the, the print and uh, wire media. Uh, we have monthly meetings with our mental health uh, community, which keeps getting bigger and bigger. It's not any, uh, it's no longer just the mental health community. <clears throat> now we have uh, representatives for uh, persons with special needs that come to our meeting. Uh, we've ramped up our meetings with the Police Advisory Board. 
we've been reaching out to the NAACP, to the Native Project, and various other constituencies, um, because we believe it's critically important um, that the community is accessible to the police department, and the police department is accessible to the community. I applaud uh, the recent proposal, uh, the charter uh, revision that went through, uh, making uh, the ombudsman's position permanent. Um, certainly the, the council, uh, Mr. Salvatore, uh, and others worked incredibly hard uh, to put that uh, language together and to get it passed by the public. I think it's a tremendous uh, move forward for us. We also are very much encouraged by the Department of Justice coming in uh, to helping us move forward. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the things you see uh, here displayed and why it's so important. If you remember, one of the use of force recommendations was the standardization of weapon systems. Um, <clears throat> right now, our officers are carrying batons uh, that look like this, generally. Um, but as you can see, it's a pretty big baton. What's happening frequently is these batons are being left in their vehicles and not being carried on their persons because of the size and the weight. What we want to do is move to what's called a collapsible baton. And as you can see, it's relatively small. Um, when it's folded in, it's that big. It actually will sit in a belt pouch so that all you'll see is a, a leather pouch or a nylon pouch about this big. But it does expand and becomes roughly a baton that's about well, probably three, three or four inches shorter um, than the issued baton now. We're also moving from the larger taser <clears throat> to a smaller version of the taser. Again, the idea being we want our officers to carry a variety of weapon systems. We want an officer confronted uh, with the situation to have as many options as possible. Clearly, our first option, and this is part of the training that we'll be uh, ramping up, is de-escalation techniques, right? We want to be able to talk through situations, calm people down, and hopefully not use any force whatsoever. However, in the event that a person continues to be aggressive, we have to give our officers a variety of tools uh, to protect themselves, to protect the, the public, um, and to protect the individual who's being aggressive towards them. Now, I don't have much police equipment on. I have probably more phones than I have police equipment. <laughs> That's the disadvantage of being the chief. But when you look at an officer in uniform on the street, you see a gun, you see a taser, you see a radio, you see a nightstick, you see one or two pairs of handcuffs, you generally see plastic uh, or rubber gloves, I should say, um, potentially even um, a face piece, so if they have to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth on somebody, um, they're able to protect themselves it all weighs a lot. Um, and so when you think about it, if you're wearing this equipment uh, 10 hours and 40 minutes a day, three or four days a week, for a 20 or 30 year career, think about the wear and tear that that takes on your body. So it's, it becomes natural to some degree for the officers to say, well, I'll leave this in the car. You know, I don't really need this big taser, so I won't have my taser. Well, what happens if when that, when that takes place, right? We're reducing their ability to have options to deal with um, an aggressive situation because their tools have become too big and too cumbersome for them to carry. Also, I think from a public perception standpoint, seeing this on an officer's belt or seeing this collapsed, which you don't even notice, it looks about the same as the pepper spray that we wear, it's a different um, presentation to the community. The smaller taser, again, a different presentation in our interactions with the community. So those are the weapon systems that we believe are important to go to, uh, to standardize, to make sure that every officer, every day that he or she goes out on patrol, is equipped with the same equipment um, and has all the equipment available to them that they need to perform their duties. We talk a lot about use of force and use of force training. One of the original, um, early on, uh, projects was the shoot don't shoot type film where um, officers were uh, shown a film in essence and uh, <clears throat> had the opportunity to work through a series of decision-making scenarios where they're shooting a bad guy, where they're shooting a good guy, 
Um, was the person really aggressive? Was it an undercover police officer? So on and so forth. Well, from that initial film that I watched in 1984 when I was in the Federal Law Enforcement Academy, we've gone to now a 360 degree scenario. A scenario that allows you to physically be in a room just like you would be in real life or out on the street uh, in a commercial building. It provides scenarios, but again, it provides those scenarios in 360 degrees. That's how we live our lives. We don't live them in one dimensional. This new system also allows us to use every weapon system we have available. So the officer now, with their equipment that's been issued to them, can go into this simulation machine with a taser, with pepper spray, with a baton, with a firearm, um, and deal with the scenarios. The system is also interactive. So the system will react to what the officer is doing. Um, it will actually um, fire projectiles back at the officer. Um, it will measure the time that it takes uh, for the officer to deploy a weapon system. It will criticize or critique, I should say, um, whether the officer um, deployed and utilized the, the correct weapon system. We've talked a lot about um, body cameras, and we are moving towards body cameras. As a matter of fact, this morning uh, we met with a vendor who we're very close to selecting. Uh, we had a good demonstration, and we're close to um, the body camera pro project. However, for many, many years, um, the vast majority of police departments in the United States have had in-car camera systems, and that's what's shown here. If you think about the um, shooting that we had the other night. Wouldn't it have been great for all of us if there had been a camera in that car that captured the initial um, vehicle pursuit, the stop, and then the unfortunate um, end to the situation that happened? Think about the questions um, that would be answered if we had um, captured that on film. We would have seen the bravery of our police officer in taking action against uh, an armed assailant <clears throat> on a traffic stop. It gives us the ability to capture the interaction between our officers and the public. So really it's a baseline, it's a first step. Going to the body cameras will add that further dimension. So now what doesn't get captured on the in-car camera, when the officer leaves the camera and potentially leaves the camera, leaves the car, and potentially gets off uh, to the side, now we have the body camera that has the ability uh, to record those interactions. Additionally, for officers who you will see more and more of on foot and on bicycles downtown, uh, the body cameras will give us the opportunity um, to actually record those interactions. So again, uh, some of the displays. In sum, we are moving very, very quickly uh, to move forward with the use of force recommendations that we fully endorse, with the ombudsman's recommendations, with the council and the mayor's recommendations. Uh, we believe uh, that it is our duty and obligation to provide uh, the most efficient, the most effective services to the community and to provide those services with integrity and dignity and respect.